Hi, I'm Doris Epstein, and this is Mensch Life TV. Today, we have an extraordinary woman that will be with us, Rahil Raza, journalist, author, interfaith leader, and an outspoken advocate for women's rights, for Muslims' women's rights. She writes and talks about Islam's war on women. She talks about gender jihad and writes about it, especially in her book, this is not their jihad, not my jihad. And Teatron Toronto Jewish Theatre, a theatre that has been called much more than a theatre. And we'll find out why with artistic director Ari Weisberg right now. Ari, welcome. Thank you, Doris. Why has it been called, Teatron, more than a theatre? What, what is it about? Well, because we try to get the community involved in different aspects of the theater. So we do produce uh, shows. We produce all Jewish themed plays and we all um, like a s mostly standard plays on the stage with an audience. But we also have discussions because many of our shows are bringing out uh, controversial issues. And so we have discussions, we have some workshops, and we try to, in, to bring in new and unknown works as well as uh, classic works to the theater. Well, the one I saw last year was remarkable, controversial, and I'm still getting attention for the review that I did on it. Pollard, Deceived, about Jonathan mm -hmm, Pollard. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the director came and talked to us about it after. Is that kind of outreach and information part of what you do? Yes, absolutely. And uh, for, for people not aware, Jonathan Pollard has been uh, uh, sentenced to life in prison for bring, uh, bringing some, so, you know, giving the Israelis some information which was supposed to be given to them anyway. Uh, about some uh, missiles and stuff in the area and he is unfortunately still sitting in jail and the play was written by an Israeli playwright and what took place originally in 98 in Israel and then we um, got back and he rewrote it a little bit and, uh, and now uh, in a translation we put that play up. It was, a, as you said, it was a, a very strong uh, hitting play uh, and, and that's the kind of plays that we like to do. So it really woke people up about mm -hmm. what the whole thing was about and he's been in prison for so long right. that, that he's kind of receded but this play mm -hmm. brought him to attention and that's the kind of thing you want to do? Yes, that's the kind of thing we do and as you uh, may be aware in the discussions afterwards, not everybody in the audience, of course, agreed. And no. there were people pro and people against. And, and, uh, we and you even, love this. Yes. You yes. love the controversy. Absolutely. You love stirring it up. Right. Although you do other things too, for sheer entertainment. I think you brought a clip with you yes. today. Yes. Uh, for instance, we did a classic, uh, Neil Simon play called Brighton Beach Memoirs. And it is, uh, as you can, uh, uh, you'll be able to see, uh, a, a Jewish-themed family comedy, but still has a um, controversial side to it. What's the controversial side? Okay, it's growing up in, in the 50s, and the children are not following their parents' desires and, 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 and wish wishes on one hand and uh, so it's kind of a growing up movie uh, play on one hand on the other hand uh, there's a family tension between uh, the sisters and the husband and so so um, you know it's not like a lovey-dovey comedy it has a lot of tension in it like most families, the dark side of most families. Right, right. But often people think when, like, a Neil Simon comedy it's is froth. It's just uh, yes. But uh, the reason that this is probably so far, it's the only Neil Simon 
play that we've done is because it has a lot of good, meaty, serious stuff in it. Of course, there are the Neil Simon famous one-liners and comedies in, uh, in it. To you, what defines Jewish theater? Oh. Is it having Jews in the cast? Is it is it something to do with Israel, or is it all? What is your definition of Jewish theater? That's a very good question, and I actually give a talk about what is a Jewish theater, and my hook for the talk is, and I have some video clips to go with it when I do give the talk, is, is The Merchant of Venice. That's a Jewish play? A Jewish play, okay? So this is the hook, and I discuss it. So basically... People, different people um, uh, determine uh, what they feel is a Jewish play. But for us, and for me as the artistic director of Tetron, for me to choose a play that has a Jewish theme, and all our plays have to have a Jewish theme, that means that the fact that the playwright happened to be Jewish... Is not enough. Or, or is or, it? Or one of the characters is Jewish, and for, for sure not if the, the actors are Jewish, is not okay. enough. Okay, we'll find out what is enough and what's required in just a minute. What is Jewish theater? Okay, for us, a Jewish play, Jewish theater is, is, a, is a theater that does Jewish plays, and for us, a Jewish play has to have a Jewish dilemma, tradition, or a controversy as the main theme of the play, as something that drives the play forward. And uh, I brought a clip of one of our plays from last year. Again, it's by Israeli playwright, uh, Moti Lerner. It's called Hard Love. And Hard Love it depicts a couple who um, were raised in Masharim, which is the very, very ultra-Orthodox neighborhood in Jerusalem. And they got married, and after they got married, the husband started to stray away from religion and from tradition. And they ended up divorcing, he moved to Tel Aviv, as people call it, Sin City, <laughs> and he's a, a writer, and he's got a, a, a wife and a lover and the whole bit, but the, but, but the whole time he still wants his, his other woman, but he, he's very, very ambivalent vis-a-vis -vis God. And the play starts um, 20 years later. They meet again because his son from second marriage falls in love with her daughter from second marriage. This is getting and, complicated. Yeah, and all that bring all the old problems uh, back up. Uh, his, his and is the girl religious like her mother? Yes. And they actually never, we never see the kids. It's the two adults and the big uh, dilemma? dilemma, the problem in the play is their relationship, not so much between each other, but between them and God. Something Can she live without God? Can he live with God? Very powerful play. So that's an example. That's an example of a very, very Jewish. It, it's not scene. just that there's a there's something deeper than than mm -hmm. and and sounds quite universal, actually. Uh, absolutely, and 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 all these problems. We go from the Jewish to the general, of course. Um, um, another play that we did last year, for instance, was called A Tiny Piece of Land. You could think it's very, very localized. Uh, it's by an American couple, playwrights, and it described a family who lived in the Gaza Strip, and they were, then they were expelled and the husband is an is a naturalized American who's lived in Israel for 25 years, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, his brother, who 
pretty well wrote him off, and they haven't spoken in 25 years, as a, he lives in America as a dentist, shows up on their, do on their doorstep. And all of a sudden, with all that background, the, the, the relationship between the two brothers who didn't see each other, and each one has their own baggage and his own reasons to do what they're doing. So the, the relationship within the family is universal. And, and, the, the, and, political and the political thing plays in, into it. So You do that a lot. Is the reason... Do you have a special perspective because you were born in Israel, you grew up, in fact, on a kibbutz that your parents founded, which is, what, what was the name of the kibbutz? Ohama. And uh, you, were, you, you have th that your basis as an Israeli. Does that affect your choice of plays? Well, it does in a way that I do like to bring Israeli plays. We've done so far three uh, Israeli written plays um, and we, we'd like to bring that perspective in. We, we, they, they don't get much play in here. Now, <laughs> I also have my own political leaning, of course, uh, and uh, I would like to, to present uh, you know, the, the case for Israel uh, and the case for Judaism. Uh, we've had uh, uh, some plays about uh, intermarriages and stuff like that, uh, and how how that works with uh, you know within the, the the so hard love was talking about two Israelis, two Jews, one secular and one religious, but we we often talk about other uh, plays that uh, are locally in North American where a, a person is, one could be religious and one lo, uh, not, one, uh, one Jewish and one not, and how they work their problems. You've also produced a play about the differences between Canadian Jews and Israeli Jews. Yes, we did that last year. It was an original play by an Israeli playwright who lives in Toronto now. It was named uh, A Hamburger and a Pita. It was funny. It was very funny, but it had a much deeper message. Certainly, certainly. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we 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 not always serious. We tried to have a comedy. We had two comedies last year, and that one was the year before. We had a comedy, and we have two comedies coming up, which we'll talk about it later. Okay, we'll talk about what's coming up and if there's going to be any changes in what you do. In a minute. Teatron Toronto Jewish Theatre and Artistic Director Ari Weisberg. This is the brochure for next year, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But first, what are we looking at now? Okay, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we deal with uh, some plays who have some people who are either Jews and non-Jews or religious and non-religious, secular. Uh, this is a clip from uh, our last play from last year called Can I Really Date a Guy Who Wears a Yarmulke? And this is a young lady who uh, falls in love with this guy who's, who's the ideal guy. He's good looking, he's funny, he's interesting, he's a doctor for God's sake, but <laughs> he is religious. Uh oh. And, and she was brought up completely secular with very little knowledge and she's got a problem. She's got a problem with the fact that he is religious. And it's a comedy, and we see their friends, and so forth and so on. But again, it's, it's coming back to, to a Jewish dilemma that, that, that's quite common in, in, our, in our society today. So uh, that's, that's what we were looking there as one of our, our shows. That's, you've, you've done this. Yeah, that was last of March. And what are your plans for next year? Are there going to be any changes? Is it going to be more of the same? Actually, what are you uh, planning? we do have a, a whole new slate, and it is uh, different in, in, in a number of ways. Um, 
we're not going to have any, uh, any of these couple secular, non-secular thing. <laughs> um, We've done it. We don't. But we start with a uh, brand new adaptation of a classic book. That is, my name is Asher Lev. By Chaim Potak. By Chaim Potak. And it's being uh, adapted by um, Aaron Posner, the same guy who adapted another book by Potak, The Chosen which we did a number of years ago, and it ran for three weeks, sold out, and we think this one will be too. It's a very interesting play and a book uh, about uh, a young man who was uh, gifted with a talent to paint. And he's painting for, from a four-year-old on. He's painting and painting and painting. The only interesting thing is he is born to a Hasidic family. And they don't? And they don't believe that it is correct to paint. And not only that, but what is he painting? He's going to the museum. Is he painting? He's copying. Naked women? Naked women and crucifixions. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a fantastic play. And there is the, re his, it, so his family and the rabbi, and the rabbi finds him a Hasidic art teacher, a famous painter. So the, the ideology, the, the, the back and forth, it's a beautiful place. And it That's, sounds very contemporary. It is. It Another is. dilemma within the Orthodox community. Absolutely, absolutely. But from a different perspective. Absolutely. The second uh, play is called Rabbi Sam, as again contemporary. This is this new age rabbi arrives in this synagogue. He used to be a uh, high flying um, lawyer in New York and he decided to become a rabbi. And he wants to change the way things are done vis-a-vis -vis the congregation, the way they, they, they welcome people and the way that Jewishness is. And he runs into a division. Half the congregation hates him. Half the congregation loves him. They want to fire him. They want to keep him. Uh, so, and it's, it's, it's funny, but it's serious. And, 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 and it's very well done. And that is by Charles Veron out of California. And we end with a play by um, James Sherman, who we who is quite a pr prolific uh, writer from uh, Chicago. We did a play of his a few years ago called God of Isaac. And this play is dedicated to the Jewish, the I should say the Yiddish theater. No, you never do Yiddish. No. This is the first time. It's not in Yiddish, it's in English. All our plays are in Refers English. Refers to. But, is, is, but this one is dedicated to the Yiddish theater. What it's all about. It's about this, it's a time traveling back and forth. It, it opens up with this uh, Hadassah group decides to uh, do a, uh, a tribute evening to the Yiddish theater. Uh, the, the, the woman, the chairwoman, actually her grandfather was a big star in the Yiddish theater. So she goes and she invites his grandson, who is now a Hollywood actor, to come in and they're doing a reading of different bits from the Jewish theater, from the Yiddish theater in English. And his wife is there too, and there's the young actress, the engineer. And of course, there's a triangle develops, and then there's a back and forth between them and the actual original Schmierniski actor, his wife, and their ingenue, <laughs> and their triangle. And it goes back and forth, back and forth, between the modern triangle and the old one, and how they deal with theater, with their wives, and with their lovers. Well, it, it sounds interesting, exciting, and informative, and that edge that you always manage to keep. It's not just funny, it's not just sentimental. There is something always deeper about it, Break a leg. Thank you very much. Meet Rahil Raza, author, 
journalist and advocate for Muslim women's rights. Rahil, welcome. Thank you. You grew up in Pakistan. Yes. In fact, you just came back from a visit there. Yes. And this is a culture where, in your words, you say women are supposed to be seen and not heard. In fact, in your book, Their Jihad, Not My Jihad, you use the phrase gender jihad. Yes, I do. What do you mean by that? Well, when I was growing up, and of course I'll age myself if I tell you how long ago that was, but it was a time when this is how I was told that girls should be seen and good Muslim girls should be seen and not heard, and I always wanted to be heard, hence the book. And gender jihad is, the word jihad means struggle. It has two meanings. It can also mean armed struggle in case of self-defense. And unfortunately, we know that the extremists have run away with the message of it being just an armed struggle. But essentially, the larger, the bigger jihad is the struggle of the soul. It is to become a better person. It's about activism. It's about doing good. It's about justice. What's gender jihad? Gender jihad is justice for women. And that is what what my struggle is, is bringing, uh, bringing out the fact that women were given rights 1400 years ago and they have been usurped over a period of time. And so this struggle to uh, do two things, one, to in, embrace those rights again, to reclaim those rights because they did exist, and the second, to let the Western world know that this is not something that is embedded in the Quran, for example, but is very patriarchal, very cultural, all about power and politics. And yet, people look to the life of Muhammad as the template on which to form their lives. He had four wives. First of all, he was polygamous, he had four wives, and secondly, the youngest was nine years old when he married, Aisha. Well, all of this How do you is get around that? First, of, first of all, Aisha's date has never been confirmed as being nine years old. It is, I mean, these was are all Was she a child? She was not a child, and this is all historical record. Let me remind you, actually, that my grandmother got married at 15, and at that time, years ago, girls used to get married when they reached puberty. So it's not unheard of, but she was not a child. Um, the fact that he married four times is for political reasons, and it's something that was allowed, and it is not the end of the world. In he fact, one of his, his wives was Jewish, I was told. Yes, is that correct? I believe historically that that is correct. Um, the life of Muhammad is an example to me, because his, the first woman he married was a woman named Khatija, who was older than him, who was a businesswoman, who sent him a proposal of marriage. So today, if women talk about liberation, I can't tell you how much more liberating one can become. This is women's rights embedded in the Quran. Muhammad, in his life, according to historical records, never, ever raised a hand on a woman. On a woman. And he, he never was said it was okay? He never said it was okay. Now, what has happened later on, though, later historians and secondary texts have misinterpreted the message of the Quran for their own interests, for their own purposes. Are you talking about the hadiths, the commentaries that I'm was talking 200 about the, later? Yes, yes, about the hadith, which was 200 years later, and then Sharia law, which was also about 100 years later, which is very anti-women. And because it became a norm, because it was, expect, it was accepted, and because women were not educated and eloquent enough to um, uh, rebel against it, it became part of life. And so for 1,400 years, all the interpretations of the Quran have been done by men until last year, when the first woman... Was uh, that accepted? Her it, interpretation? It, it, it has been, uh, it's been very controversial. And most of the male scholars have said that it's not a good interpretation because she's interpreted it very differently. It's a very softer, gentler uh, interpretation, uh, actual, actual translation. It's not even an interpretation. She has translated it. And the problem lies in the translation of Arabic into any other language because it, it loses much of the essence and people interpret it according to their own wishes which has been mostly male. In, uh, in the Muslim religion, then, you're saying women are not second-class citizens, women are not possessions, chattels, for men to use and misuse. 
What about divorce? All it Do takes I, is <laughs> all it takes is is uh, I divorced thee three times. Is that yeah, correct, Doris? Do I look like the kind of woman who would remain in the faith faith if it was unfair to you women? You are a devout Muslim. You I am a devout, devout Muslim. Muslim, and I I would like to tell you that my jihad, my struggle to find uh, the rights of Muslim women, has been done through a lot of research and study. I'm a practicing Muslim woman, and I know for a fact that it's not embedded in the faith. Um, the, a woman can ask for a divorce. A man can give a divorce as well. The fact that a man says three times, I divorce you, is something that has been totally misconstrued. The basis of that essentially is that one should not divorce in a hurry. So if a man and a woman decide that they're getting a divorce, they should give a gap of a month each so that they can be sure that this is what they want. Can a woman initiate a divorce? Absolutely. A woman can ask for a divorce on a simple basis that she does not like the way the man looks. And this is a historical record where a man, woman came to the Prophet and said, I can't live with this man. I don't like the way he looks. And the Prophet said to her, go back and try once again. And he said this to her three times, which is what the, so that she would be sure. And the third time he said, you don't have to live with a man who you can't stand uh, the way he looks. And so a woman absolutely can ask for so a what divorce you're saying under the faith. Now, I'm talking about, you know, theory and practice. There is a huge gap between what theoretically the Quran gives us as rights. And practice. And, and, practice. and we'll understand more about this when, in our next segment. Okay. The difference between theory and practice, and it's something that all of us have to understand better. Yes. Rahil, you say people really don't understand Islam. Yes. And that there's a big difference between theory and practice. Yes. Many Muslims don't understand Islam. Unfortunately, there are Muslim women who don't know what the rights are that are given to them under the faith of Islam. There's a big difference between theory and practice. And I very quickly should take you back 1400 years ago when Islam came as a message. It was a very uncivilized society. This was pre-Islam where, you know, newborn girls used to be buried alive. Women were considered to be without a soul. They were sold and bought as slaves. And in this milieu came this message that said, you know, heaven lies at the feet of your mother. That said, treat women equally. There's an entire chapter in the Quran called Nisa, which is about women. And it says men and women are equal in the eyes of God. And look at the concept of creation. In, uh, for in the Quran, creation is not that woman was made from Adam's rib. Creation is that men and women were created from a single soul. And that is what God says. I'm empowered by the word of God, which tells me that I am, as a human being, equal, maybe physically, uh, you know, different, but spiritually totally equal. And I want to reclaim those rights that were given to me under the faith, the right to keep my married name, the right to ask for a divorce, the right to ask for marriage, give a proposal of marriage like Khatija did, the right to go to war, the right to work, the right to vote. All of this was given to women 1400 years ago. But then power, patriarchy and politics came into play and it was so much better for the men not to share the wealth, not to let the women know what their rights are so that they wouldn't be in competition. And added to this, in countries like Pakistan, where I come from, there is 75% of the population is uneducated and illiterate. And from that 75%, the majority are women because it's better to keep them ignorant so that they can't ask for their rights. And that is the biggest problem, economic and educational empowerment that is needed so that women can then fight this battle from within. But you're doing that. Yes, but I'm one person. Uh, you know, we need more voices. I'm doing that because Why I have the Why aren't there more voices? Well, people are afraid in countries uh, like Pakistan. People are afraid for their lives. I mean, I have received death threats right here in Canada. And I have a husband and sons who support the work that I do. I have the freedom to speak out, but I could not have the conversation I'm having with you in my country of birth. And that is very sad. You're just back from Pakistan. I'm back from Pakistan. In Pakistan, majority of prisoners are women. Yes. Women who have been imprisoned because they were raped. 
Yes. Can you explain that to us? It is a very sad thing. Rape is used as a weapon to silence women. And when women are raped under one aspect of Sharia law, which, by the way, is not divine law. Many people think that Sharia is divine and it's right out of the Quran. It's not. It's a man-made law, literally man-made law. And under some aspect of Sharia law, the, unless two witnesses are produced, the woman cannot produce rape. Now, can you imagine that a woman who is raped is going to produce two witnesses, and they have to be male witnesses. And they have to be male witnesses. They have witnesses. to be male witnesses. Therefore, many women, even after rape, are jailed because they're told that they were adulterous. And therefore, many women don't report the rapes. It is a very, very imperfect, imbalanced power structure where power lies in the hands of the males. And women are not empowered, although in cities, of course, there is a huge movement for women to take back their rights and they're working to change the laws. And as education and economic empowerment comes to uh, my land of birth, there is hope that there will be change. I was so thrilled to see grassroots movements. There by actually women. are grassroots movements. There are, there are, and you don't hear about them no. because they don't, they don't want to be exposed for fear of their lives. There are many grassroots women, movements by women who are trying to educate, who are trying to bring about this change. And so I have hope for the next generation, but uh, unless men are also educated, the change won't come. You see, unless I educate my sons that men and women are equal, the change won't come. So it's not just that women need to be educated, men need to be educated. Are men well. involved in Pakistan and the grassroots movement? Not really. <laughs> They're too involved in their politics and their power. Um, a few good men, yes, but not at large. because. Who wants to give up power and privilege? Tell me, when they've got uh, an entire community waiting on them and they have the power, it's very hard to give it up. And they're not willing to do that. And it doesn't come from the top down. You see, this grassroots movement is there, but there, has, there have to be institutions. There are no institutions left in Pakistan. This is being done by individuals, and unless it comes from the top down, and the guy at the top has so much privilege that he's not concerned about what's happening to women's rights. Again, the change is going to come from North America. This the is tail where, that wags the dog is yes, the expression. Yes, it's going to come from North America because this is where scholars, academics are reinterpreting the parts of the Quran. You know that every scripture is that allowed to reinterpret the Quran yes, or to course. give any interpretation. Well, that has been the problem for so long. Is that anybody who thought uh, you know who had an, a PhD in front of their name decided to interpret according to their own understanding? In Islam, we don't have formalized priesthood, formalized clergy. And the reason is that we as individuals should be able to read and understand and interpret it into our lives. But it's always been done by men. Now change is coming. And that's what's creating a lot of the backlash. So women like you are on the front line, yes. on the frontier, and you've been threatened for this. And yes. we'll talk about that when we come back. Rahil Raza, we've talked about Pakistan, we've talked about the differences with Muslims, the fact that you claim Muhammad would not have agreed with Sharia law or with many of the interpretations of what Islam is about. Yeah. Are people bringing this baggage to Canada? We yes. see honor killings, although other people do honor killings. Muslims do it more than anybody else. Absolutely. People are bringing in what I call excess cultural baggage. This is all cultural, you know, FGM, honor killings, all Female of genital are, mutilation. Yes, yes. These are cultural practices. They are not at all Is that happening, female genital world. mutilation? Is that happening in I family? believe it is. And people are turning a blind eye to it because this, they think that it is part of the faith, where it's not. Absolutely not. Any kind of harm to another human being. You know, the Quran says that killing one person is like killing all of humanity. And I know that there is a saying in Judaism which is very you similar. You kill one person. You kill one person, you kill all of humanity. That's right. It's there very much. And that's what embodies the work that I do. And you save one life, you save humanity. So there is absolutely 
uh, no way that this could be considered part of the faith. It's a cultural practice, this idea of honor. But of course, it is again embedded in the power and the patriarchy, the idea that they can own women, that uh, you know, daughters and wives are uh, like pieces of furniture that you can tell them what to do or what not to do. The you amazing know. thing is that Canadian Muslim girls yes. are going for it. Well, yes. We see more hijabs, we see more burqas, we never saw the veil ever yes. in this country. Well, the hijab has become a sort of a political statement. I'm Muslim, look at me. And so, you know, that it doesn't have the same connotation of the modesty and the humbleness that was supposed to have gone with it for many people. Of course, some wear it with conviction and that's fine because, you know, a head covering doesn't make anyone brain damaged. However, the face covering is a huge problem, and that is, again, a tribal cultural practice that has been imported because Canada says, welcome, bring all your excess baggage, and let's play it out here because we are politically correct, because we have multiculturalism, and under this banner of multiculturalism, you can do whatever you want. So this honor killing that, uh, that took place in Kingston was absolutely appalling because these girls had reached out for help. But, you know, people didn't want to step in there because of multiculturalism. So Canadians need to be less politically correct and whatever is wrong needs to be pointed out. I mean, as a Muslim Canadian, I find it appalling that we just don't speak out about issues that are uh, humanly wrong. Why don't Muslim Canadians speak out? When there's a terror attack in Israel, when there's an attack on young innocent girls, Yes. Death. Yes. Why don't they speak out? Well, because they're sitting on the shelf. Maybe they're afraid. Maybe. But you have organizations. You have well, institutions. Well, of course. And, and that is uh, our big concern as well, that yes, these voices need to be heard loud and clear. Because, you know, justice, when I want justice for myself, I must want the same justice for you as well. But there's only few of us who actually speak out about these issues. I now, find about that on, strange. Yes, I and find about that honor strange. killings. I was at the United Nations, and I uh, was trying to table a petition to say that honor killings need to be made an international criminal offense. They have not been an international criminal offense. And in some countries, like Jordan and Pakistan, again, according to some aspect of Sharia law, the killers get away with it. So, for example, if a son murders a sister, the father will forgive him, and then the law can't get to him. So these laws have to be changed, and there has to be an understanding that human life is extremely important. In some countries, a life of a woman is not equal to the life of a man. And that is one of the saddest things in, in a faith where women are given so much importance originally, initially in the text. And it's not being respected. You know, women are not respected as hum equal human beings. And unfortunately, many women out of ignorance accept this as well. And so this is where part of the problem is that we women have to empower themselves, educate themselves, not only in secular knowledge, but in knowledge of the scripture like I did, to know that it is within the faith that we empower ourselves, that nobody can walk over us, that we don't need to be told how to dress or how to behave. We are adults and we know how to behave. But this, this idea that, you know, because the Quran says that men are responsible for women, it has been misinterpreted to mean that men own women. The responsibility 1400 years ago was that women didn't work, so men would take care of them. But that, of course, has been translated to mean that they own their souls, that they own their bodies. And, you know, this power and privilege needs to be swept away from under the feet of these men so that they understand. So you don't believe that there should be uh, Islamism everywhere, that, that, that Sharia law should triumph over secular law? No, of course not. Sharia law is not even practiced with equal justice in Muslim countries, leave alone trying to interpret it or implement it in a non-Muslim country. And there are aspects of Sharia law itself that says that it shouldn't be practiced in a non-Muslim country. So there's absolutely no reason and absolutely no justification for trying to force Sharia law into a non-Muslim land. You know, secular law is fine for me and for thousands of other Muslims who don't speak out, but they should because this is to their own detriment that they are staying quiet. And this silence that is Are they afraid? There are many reasons they're also afraid, but this silence is creating more harm than anything else around us. Well, you're not afraid. 
You've spoken not only nationally, but in Geneva internationally to the Human Rights Commission of the UN. Yes. And I applaud you, and I hope you continue, and good health and strength to you. Thank you. This is Doris Epstein. Don't forget to be a mensch. Thank you.